I remember well the summer of my 15th year. It was August, and it was uh, two-a-day football practice. I remember it well. I was fighting for a place on the starting team. And I weighed 155 pounds. I ate hamburgers. I drank milkshakes. I did everything, everything I knew to try to get bigger. After practice, I was down to 150 pounds, but usually 155 pounds, that's all I could ever be. I made the starting team the last day of practice. I was fast. I was on the track team, you know, and our track team was state champs. We even set a record in the 880 relay. No one had ever run as fast as we ran that day. I was fast, man. I was, I was fast. Which, which is a good survival skill if you go up against someone who's 50 pounds bigger than you. I was fast. It was during that same two-week period of my 15th year, that August, that my church, my local church, had, some of you will understand this, a tent revival. Now, you can't find revivals like that much anymore. This was one of those old, we didn't have snakes, no, we weren't into snakes, but it was an old-fashioned revival. Now, Billy Graham, you know, got started in a tent revival. In 1949, he did a big tent revival in Los Angeles, and the newspapers picked up the stories of all of these people coming to hear this young preacher, and Billy Graham got sent into national prominence, and you know the rest of the story. would have practice. I'd go home and eat dinner. Go down a block, down the street, and there in the church parking lot was this big tent. And people came from all over the county. It was a county-wide revival, and there were people from all different kinds of churches there, as well as from my local church. It was a big deal. I had a, a song leader, a handsome guy, who led the singing and played the trumpet. He claimed that in his previous life, he played for people like Doris Day and movie stars like that. I don't know. Then this little man about the size of Zacchaeus, he would get up and he would start preaching. And boy, did he preach. And he, he, would, count, he would start out preaching in a sports coat, and it was, oh, those, those summer nights in Missouri in August were so hot. But after a few moments of preaching, he would take off his sport coat and would pull out a white handkerchief, and the perspiration just would hang in the air. And my, did he preach. Two weeks, every night, I went, 15 years old. I was a member of the church, so it wasn't an introduction to the Christian faith for me. I, I had already joined. I was already a part of the church. But maybe you know the story of John Wesley, where he, he was an ordained Anglican priest. He had gone on a missionary journey from England to Georgia, a rather failed uh, missionary journey. There was a storm coming back on the ship, and he was scared for his life. He, he was like a child fearful while all of the Moravians were sitting there singing their hymns. They were just happy to live or die. It didn't bother them at all. But he was scared to death. And he got back to England and he decided, maybe I'll just throw it in, you know. I, I'm not much good at any of this. And then he was invited to this meeting at Aldersgate. He says that he reluctantly 
Did you ever go to church reluctantly? Oh, no. It's Sunday again. Oh, gosh, do I have to go. Oh, come on. Let me just skip today. Well, he was reluctant. He didn't want to go. But he went. And he sat there, and there was people around the room, and it was the driest kind of thing you could ever imagine. Somebody was reading out of a book commentary, Luther's commentary in the book of Romans. I can't think of anything drier or less interesting to do on a night like that. My, my experience in that tent was very emotional. Wesley's was not. He was listening to the words, Luther's commentary, and he says that his heart was strangely warmed. Evidently, he had moved from one stage, from one stage of faith to a higher stage. I did during those two weeks in that tent. My heart was changed, strangely warmed. I, I moved from whatever stage I was in to a different stage, and it's never left me. I still live in the blessing of those two weeks when I was 15 years old. Psalm 1 that I read partially from this morning is a celebration of that kind of faith. It talks about a person who's blessed, who meditates and delights in God's word, day and night, feeling the presence of God and delighting in that and knowing how fortunate and blessed his life is because he's feasting and living and learning and growing in God's presence and God's word. And he says that people who are like that are like people who are like trees. They're, they're planted by the water and they're nourished all the time and their fruit comes and blesses, and their leaves never wither. That's a psalm of personal faith. All of us have a story of personal faith. It was that moment in our lives where we would be able to sing, Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. That personal faith, which is essential and important. A blessing. We hold to it. We, we're nourished by it. And then Psalm 2 shows up. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 belong together. They are an introduction to all of the psalms that are going to follow. There's 148 psalms to follow. There are 150 psalms altogether. And these two psalms, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, stand together as an introduction to all of the psalms that follow. Psalm 1 celebrates. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd, I'd rather be his and have riches untold. I'd, I'd rather, you know, you know that song? I'd rather have Jesus than anything the world affords today. That's personal faith. It's so beautiful. It's so important. But Psalm 2 if you listen to that first word of that psalm, says, Why do the nations, I'll use another translation's word now, not the one we used this morning, Why do the nations rage? You see what has happened here? Psalm 1 has begun with, celebration of personal faith, and then immediately it begins 
Psalm 2 with lifting us out of that personal faith, that private, beautiful faith that we have, and lifting us up to see the world and ask the question of the world, why do the nations rage? So we're, the picture, the, the vision, the experience moves from personal to world, from individual to cosmic. Why do the nations rage? Why do the kings and rulers conspire? Why do they want to break the yoke, break the fetters, be free of God? Psalm 2 is a picture of the world out of whack. It's a picture of a fallen world. It's a picture of the world that we understand biblically as being out of whack from the very beginning. We put the world out of whack. In the book of Genesis, the story starts that God talks to Adam in the garden and even before God says, don't eat of this tree, that's the only one you can't eat, even before he says that, he says to Adam that he's to work the garden and take care of it. That the earth is to be taken care of and nurtured and blessed. And when sin comes into the story, not only does it come into the personal experience of Adam and Eve, who are personally involved in the break of the relationship that they have with God, who want to go their own way and be their own God, and therefore they have taken what was not theirs to take, Not only do they experience the broken relationship, but God says to Adam, Cursed is the ground. Not only does sin enter the individual heart, it enters the earth, it enters the cosmos, it enters the institutions, so that now the whole world is out of whack and every institution and every organization and every relationship and the earth itself is under the curse that sin has entered and broken apart everything that we have and everything that we touch. I was a busy uh, pastor of a thriving congregation when I was in Indiana as a young pastor. And one day I opened my mail. I was sitting at my desk and I opened my mail and I read this letter. It was from missionaries that I knew in Central America. Nicaragua, to be exact. And I can recall reading that letter and thinking, everything that I'm reading here in this letter is at odds with everything that I'm hearing and reading everywhere else. And I knew I had to be a part of finding the truth. I joined 12 or 15 other people, and we flew from Miami to Managua, the capital of Nicaragua. We were Catholics and Baptists and Presbyterians, all kinds of different people, men and women. We met. There was a a nation at that time in civil war, and we met with the opposition groups. We heard the stories of groups and people from both sides of the civil war and the conflict. We weren't on we weren't there to take sides. 
We weren't on this side or this side. We were on God's side. Our destination, ultimately, and most importantly, was a town in the very northern part of Nicaragua, a, a city named Ocotal. It was where most of the fighting between the two groups in civil war were fighting each other. And our purpose, as others who had gone before us and others who would come after us, our purpose was to stand in the middle between the fighting groups, to stand in the middle in the hope and belief that if there were North American Christians between the two warring factions, fewer bullets would fly. I had gone from Psalm 1 to Psalm 2. From celebrating personal faith to understanding that the world was part of that faith as well and that there's nothing left out. Do you understand? If you're at stage five, would you try to take a step just for a moment into stage six, the highest form of spirituality and faith? Would you come there with me just for a moment and just for this moment see that all of life is connected? There is no we and them, us and others. We are all connected together. All of life is connected together. And everything that happens is part of this web of connectedness of which God is at the center and the circumference, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, and all of life is webbed together into one piece. Why on earth did Jesus say that we are to pray for our enemies? Why on earth would he say that unless we are connected in this web? Why do we give aid and comfort and water and help? Why do we pray for those who persecute us? Why do we love the unlovely? Why does Mother Teresa pick up someone dying where the rats are eating the limbs and only has a few hours to live? Why does she wash the body as she's washing the feet of Jesus? It's because she moved from Psalm 1 to Psalm 2 and there's this connectedness all of life. Every person, every moment, we are living in this web of connectedness. Part of God, part of the world, part of each other. And it makes a difference then. If you stay with me now in stage six, I know you want to go back. You want to go back to stage five or stage four, wherever. You want to be... You want to be in Psalm 1? It's so nice to stay there, just me and Jesus, nobody else. But stay with me here just for a moment in stage 6. Everything that happens in this web is important to us. When bombs fall in Syria and a hospital is destroyed and most of the doctors of the city are killed, we're part of that. That diminishes us. When rockets fall in Yemen on a school bus and little children, five, six, seven years old, when they are destroyed in a school bus because rockets have fallen on that school bus, we're part of that. 
part of that web. Psalm 2 calling us to this larger vision, this larger sense of relationship, that we're all together, we all belong in this web of interconnectedness where God is at the center and at the circumference of our lives. When we use the oceans and the rivers as our toilets, when we throw plastic in the waters that kill the fish, when the great coral reef of Australia dies by the moment and others like it around the world are choking for life, it's part of that web of interconnectedness, of which we are all a part. That's why Paul, as he writes his letter to the Romans, this is stage six thinking, stay with me just for a minute. I know you want to leave. Paul says, the creation itself, the creation itself, will be liberated and discover the glorious freedom of the children of God. You see, not only will we be liberated individually, but the whole creation is groaning. The whole creation is under the curse. And God's good news is that not only will we be individually redeemed and saved, but that whole creation that God has made so beautifully and wonderfully and is so out of whack is part of that redemptive work of God and therefore part of our work in prayer and concern. I graduated from seminary in 1967. The Vietnam War was raging. Had a brother-in-law, two brothers-in-law, one died, Agent Orange. It was a very personal thing to us, to our family. And I was, um, I was pretty much not feeling very good about the Vietnamese. I, I thought they were my enemy. And I read a report about the, these Quakers. They, Quakers and some other peace groups were sending food to the North Vietnamese. And you know what? I was upset. I was a little bit more than upset. I was angry. And I was on the eve of graduating from seminary. You would have thought that I would have learned something by then. But God was not finished with me. And God is not finished with you. Will you help me to live in stage six? And if I can, I'll help you to find that place where all of creation becomes part of our prayer and our care. In Jesus' name, amen.